The island of New Wessex is situated in the Severn Estuary off the south coast of Wales. Built on a strong island culture, the people were proud of their heritage and relative solidarity and autonomy from the other nations of Great Britain. The railways brought the island into the modern era, with links to Britain's towns, cities and industries allowing goods and people to travel freely between. With the growth of the railways came the growth of New Wessex's own industries and towns with a huge influx of tourism. There were two routes on the island. The first was the main line from the island's capital, Alfredston, through to the north coastal town of New Harlech, where the railway dove under the Harlech Strait to join the mainland at Porth Call. Roughly halfway along this main line was the market town of Repford. Here was the beginning of the other line, a 15 mile branch line along what is colloquially known as the Stovall Valley Railway. This follows in most part the path of the River Stowe to its end at Stowmouth. We start our tales in 1954, just under a decade since the end of World War II. The country was still pulling itself out of the shadow of the devastating conflict. Pastures new beckoned, and the shackles of the past being thrown to the wayside, the people of the world looking forward to the future. I am Lord Montague Stavell, and these are the stories of the engines and people that make up the island of New Wessex. So lads, do you reckon Lord Stavella's going to mention this audit again today? Well, let's see, sure, he's mentioned it every briefing for the last three weeks. I'm not sure he's going to stop now. I mean, he could give it a rest, it's tomorrow. I'm sure we aren't going to forget that fact. All we need to do is get on with our jobs as normal, and we'll have no problems. <laughs> don't you believe it? My Rod, you're quaint. Well, if you're anything to go by, then we'll have a right proper job getting through it, won't we? That's just rude. I mean, if you got your shunting done on time, I might be able to get my freight trains to the junction to make the connection. Oh, if we're driving at you again then, Rook, my coaches need to be in the platform. What's this? Destroy Rook Day? I mean, it might not be us that destroy you if I'm late again at the junction. You know how Hercules likes to be. Not just Hercules. If Lord Stavell has a bad audit, we might get some random mainlander as our controller, and I'm sure we wouldn't want that. I really, really don't like that idea. I don't want no mainlander coming over here and taking his job. Who's taking my job? Oh, no one, sir. Well, we hope not anyway. Oh, this wouldn't have anything to do with the audit tomorrow, would it? Well, we'd be lying if we weren't worried about it. You have been sending us on edge about it for the past few weeks, sir. Oh, I have? That was rather foolish of me. It was. Of course it wasn't, you halfwits. This is an audit, not some charity fundraiser. You have to be clean, presentable, accountable, and most importantly, on time. I'm always on time. I'll believe that when I see it. Anyway, I'm down here to tell you that the SS Kent has taken the coal order and dropped off some supplies for transfer to Retford Docks. The train is waiting, sure. It needs to leave before Rod's first passenger train to ensure the timetable allows Brides Express down the branch later. The empty coal wagons need to be at the Seven Tunnel Junction by midday, so they have to be on the mid-morning goods off the island. As for you two, continue with your duties as normal, please. Yes, yes sir. sir. I left the sheds having made my morning announcements at both ends of the branch. I'd already seen my engines at the junction, Ben, Oliver and Bride. By now, Ben and Oliver were simmering in the platforms waiting to depart. Ben had his also coaches ready to run to Alfredston, and Oliver was preparing to head for the coast, working the opposite timetable to Rod. You know, Ben, I'm still pretty jealous that you get to stretch your wheels along the main line every day. You know it's only for a stock positioning move. Yeah, of course I do. You could always volunteer for the mail train from time to time. I'm sure Bride would enjoy a night off once in a while. Are you kidding? I spend most of the day toddling up and down this branch. Sleep is precious. Well, quit complaining, I'm out of here. Remember, Ben, be clean, presentable, accountable, and don't say it, on time. Oh, I cannot wait for this audit to be over. Oh, that goes for all of us, mate, no doubt. The pannier departed, making his way along the mainline section to Alfredston, part of his daily diagram as the shuttle train between Alfredston, Stobra, and Stomouth. He provided a vital link between the extremities of the branch and the capital of the island.
Meanwhile, back at Stomouth Docks, Shaw had been attached to his wagons and was waiting for permission to pull up the incline to the junction with the main branch. He waited and waited, but the foreman still wouldn't allow him to leave. Ugh, if I'm any later, I'll get stuck behind Rod. Not long after, he heard the unmistakable whistle of Rook, and sure enough, backing down the incline towards him, came the grubby pannier. So much for being on time. Oh, you'll be gone soon. Stop your worrying. Rod is still 15 minutes from leaving anyhow. Yeah, but I could have been well in front by now. Anyway, what are you here for? You're supposed to be at the shed on standby for Brides Express. Last minute change of schedule to this train. Wyvern Industries want the materials to their factory this morning, so it needs to go to Stober as soon as possible. I'm to leave not long after Rod has gone. Right, you can go, sure. Well, I'd love to stay and chat, Rook, but you know how it is. Oh, go on, get out of here. Shaw blasted his way out of the harbour and onto the branch. The early morning mist hung in the air as he followed the route of the Stowe River with his heavy load, the scenery and railway undulating as he went. Passing through Sparsholt and watching the sleepy town of Stober beginning to wake, Shaw was reminded of the stark differences in his life since he had moved to the island from the hustle and bustle of the South Wales coal fields. He was looped to the bottom of the incline to Castle Stavell, and whilst he waited for the down train to pass, he listened to the dawn chorus filling the air. Soon, Oliver came into sight with a friendly greeting and disappeared just as quickly. Without further interruption, Shaw departed for the junction. He left the wagons in the siding and headed to the sheds to top up on water. Good morning, Shaw. Oh, hi, Bride. Enjoying your lion? I've only been back for a couple of hours. They were late calling me up a canton for my return trip. And yet you still come back here to sleep. Why not just use Alfreston's shed? You'd have had more rest. You know, I like my peace and quiet. That place is a complete opposite. I mean, you may like it being from that kind of background, but I've lived in relative rurality for all my life. Of course, the thrill of the city is all well and good, but only in small doses. You know, I was just thinking about this very subject today on my run up the line. Oh, really? Missing the hustle and bustle of the coal field? I'm really not, actually. I was thinking about how lucky I am to have escaped the hustle of life up there. We're all extremely lucky to be working here on the island. It's peaceful, but not boring. I remember when you first arrived here to join us. Can't have been more than two months after the end of the war. I don't think I've ever seen a more tired engine. Well, we literally powered the war machine. Coal and steel from South Wales was needed everywhere. I mean, I brought stuff through here to the harbour at Stomouth many times during the war. I'm glad you found peace here. There's a sense of longevity and safety here that I haven't felt anywhere else. Lord Stavell really knows how to run this place, even after having the railway change ownership from under his feet twice. He's made this place his own. He really has. It never stopped being his. Not really. Ah, well, maybe not Alfredston. So, what are you guys doing for the audit? I won't be here. I checked my allocations for the week and they want me to cover an old oak job. I'm staying over tonight and returning in the evening, after the audit is done. You'll probably have Morgan doing my job tomorrow. It's not like he does anything else useful. I heard that! I'm going to be continuing as normal because the audit doesn't actually apply to me. Yeah, well, you and Francesco can go and be Midland buddies somewhere else. Alright, temper temper. Well, you'd be feeling on edge if your Shedmaster kept ramming this audit in your smoke box for three weeks. I can't imagine what it's like having it from Lord Storrell, though. You do not want to know. We just want the entire affair done with. You have it easy on that branch. And you have it easy here. I don't owe Stavell anything. You know we'd all just get moved on to another shed if they closed the railways. 
Who said anything about closed railways? Oh, don't get him started, Stan. He's a conspiracy theorist. He seems to think that BR are conspiring to begin mass closures of railways. Oh, don't listen to him. BR wouldn't. Why would they close lines that make them profit? Your services might make them money, but branch lines would be gone. Ben, you better watch your back because they're a coming. Didn't realise this was Halloween. I'm sure that would be a great story to start telling the young BR standards, but we weren't built yesterday, you know, pilot. You know as well as I do what a state the railways were left in after the great skirmish of the last decade. Yeah, why do you think we were nationalised? I don't trust the government, they're up to something. Governments attempt to cut costs, it's not hard to see. Look mate, back up north where I take my expresses and such, they rely on the railways. I can't see them pulling the rail services. Steel is quite the valuable commodity. I'm washing my buffers of this nonsense. I'll see you lot in a couple of days. Don't do anything stupid and get us through this audit, will you? I'm not promising anything. Can you promise to bring my coaches to the platform on time? Sod off, get your own coaches. You're all so angry. Fine, I'll go get my own coaches. I'm a strong independent engine who don't need no station pilot. But you'll block my path out. Schedule says I'm next. Oh, fine, off you go. Looking back on this particular occasion, I do now feel that I could have handled the situation in a calmer manner, but it was my neck on the line too. The stress of running a railway on behalf of a nationalised company that took over from the company that revoked my own autonomy of the railway I'd love and built from the ground up with my father and grandfather. I was not in the mood to lose control of the island's network, nor was I prepared to see it close down completely. Later that very day, I was doing my own audit of paperwork at Stobra Station when Ben, Rook and Rod's services all coincided at the station. I overheard their conversation. Afternoon Ben, Rod, what's the gossip then? Well, Pi is making some of his fantastical claims down at Alfredston. Really sounds like he believes his stories. <laughs> wouldn't take much notice of him. We all know his stories are fed to him by someone at Swansea Shed. They're all a bunch of big-headed idiots, probably trying to make him explode with worry. I mean, they wouldn't close the railways now. If anything, branch lines would have started closing during the aftermath of the war, wouldn't you think? He's got a point. If they've just lifted rationing restrictions, then they must not be worried about money. Surely that means we're safe. And they've been constructing new steam engines, that's got to mean something. Have you not noticed what they've been? Big Pacifics or 460s? Yeah, and? When was the last time you saw a Pacific on a branch line? That's why they're building smaller engines too, so I've heard. Yeah, so you've heard. I haven't seen any, have you? I mean, no, I haven't, but I'm sure they're being built at Swindon. What if that means they'll replace us old designs? You were literally built three years ago. If anything, you're the safest of all of us here. Oh yeah. Look, lads. You two are the safest on the island. You were built specifically for old Stovey over there, and I can't imagine him wanting you gone. Oh, hang on. I can honestly say I've never heard such wibble in my entire life, and from experienced engines. Afternoon, Stovey. I beg your pardon, who is Stovey? Well, that would be you. I prefer sir or my lord, that would be, you know, the proper way. You what? Oh, whatever. Anyway, I wanted to spell some myths you lot are spouting. Wait, where are you going, Rod? It's time to leave, you know. I've got to be clean, presentable, accountable, and most importantly, on time. You facetious little... You won't hear the last of that. Worth it. Right, anyway, as I was saying... Don't look at me, sir. Well, you know the score, you've been here long enough. Also, yes, those standards are being built, but no, they won't work on this branch. BR won't want to waste their time sending them here when we're doing so well without them anyway. I understand, sir. You reckon this audit will go well, then? As long as I can get the guys at Alfreston and New Harlech to play ball, then we should be fine. I mean, I've tried my hardest here, where I have direct control over your movements and the line as a whole. But because I've allowed Alfreston to be run separately, it'd be hard to see how that goes. We will all give it a go, sir. We joke around and try to make light of the situation because I think we all really do care. I'm glad to hear it, Rook. Now, get on with your shunting or something. I've got a ballast order to place with Mr. Dexby. I left Rook to do whatever he was doing and made the ballast order with Mr. Henry Dexby. His family's links with the island's railways were almost as close as my own. His father, Arthur Dexby, provided the original fleet of hunter-class locomotives for the railway in 1893. They only left the island in 1925 once the Great Western had taken over from the private New Wessex and Mainland Joint Railway Company as part of the Grouping Act. Dexby Engine still worked on the island as part of a personal contract between New Wessex and the Dexby Railway, 
to deliver good quality ballast for the permanent way. My little thank you for his part in the history of the railway. I'm happy to say that the rest of the day went by without further problems, and Bright's Express wasn't hampered by BR at Cardiff. I made a special request for all my branch engines to meet me at Repford Sheds that evening for a briefing. Well, engines, tonight we stand on the brink, looking into the abyss. Oh, quit that. We aren't going to war, sir. Yes, yes, all right. I thought it was quite the epic start to my speech, though. Speech? Are you kidding? Of course I am. Look, I gathered you all here this evening because I won't be doing my normal rounds tomorrow morning. I will be meeting the auditors off the train at New Harlick. They will begin there, before progressing to Repford, and going down the branch, and back, before ending at Alfredston. What I want is the railway to continue as normal, as I've implied for the last, well, however long it's been. I can feel every single day of it too. We can see it all over your paintwork as well, look how filthy you are. I've never seen an engine do so little and get so dirty. Yes, yes, very funny. As part of duties tomorrow, I need an engine to transport the auditors and myself around the island. I've decided that Rook, You'll be the engine to carry out this task. As a result, I'm having you cleaned overnight and will want you to use the special coach at Stonemouth to provide our transport. You'll collect it early in the morning, pick me up from Castle Stavell, and we shall make our way to New Harlick. The rest of you will have to manage without a station pilot, and it also does mean that you, sure, will be carrying out any local freight duties that crop up during the day. Well, I guess I can manage that, sir. Are you... Don't say it. Yeah, but are you... Rook, please. Are you sure? I hate you. Rook, you really are an annoying little git. I try my best. Wish you'd try your best at doing your actual job. I resent that. I work harder than you, you young entitled little twat. Boys, will you behave? Lord Stavell is attempting to be serious for five minutes, and all you lot are doing is berating each other. Pull yourselves together. Sorry, Sorry Bride. Bride. Right, anyway, thank you, Bride. I just wanted to finish off, if I can get a word in, and if you guys will stop attempting to murder each other, by saying good luck, and thank you in anticipation of an easy day tomorrow. Off you go. The engines dispersed, Rod, Rook and Shaw running in convoy back to Stomer. Oliver, Ben and Bride hunkering down for the night. I headed to Castle Stavell for a restless night of sleep. Rook spent the night in relative luxury. He was cleaned, then polished, and cleaned again for good measure. He was given the best quality Welsh steam coal and simmered happily outside the shed, whilst Rod and Shaw slept inside. Being cleaned had revealed his lined livery, which he was sure hadn't been seen since the day he'd left the paint shop. It was still dark when he collected the chocolate and cream Mark I from the siding, ran round and began his trip along the line to New Harlick. He picked me up at Castle Stavell. I haven't seen you this clean since the day you returned from the paint shop. I almost forgot I asked for you to be lined out. I'd like to see it more often, sir. It's a handsome livery. Obviously not a patch on the Great Western Green. Oh well, of course not, but it reminds me of our original livery on the Hunters. Anyway. Less reminiscing, let's get to New Harlech, busy day ahead of us. I got on board the coach and began setting myself up for the audit, whilst Rook whisked me through the island's countryside.
We arrived into New Harlech as the sun was beginning to rise, and no sooner had Rook run round the coach had the main express arrived from Cardiff on its way to Alfredston. Two men got off the train. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning, my lad. I trust you had a pleasant trip to get here. Well, as good as could be expected, having gotten up in an ungodly hour this morning. Can I get you any refreshments before we begin? I think we'd better not. I'd rather get straight down to business. Very well. All the paperwork you'll need to peruse is on board my coach sat in the other platform. But as per the audit brief, I'll walk you around the station first so you can see what's what. Splendid. Top marks for organisation, at least. And before we get started, I just want to introduce my assistant here. He's learning the ropes and will be watching the audit, so he too will be able to carry them out to the same high standards that I do. Yes, very nice to meet you, I'm sure. This way, gentlemen. I directed them down the platform towards the station facilities as the train pulled out of the station. We spent a long time studying and discussing aspects of the station's working practice, and when it came to our extra platforms, the auditor made notes in his books. I see we have a bay platform. Now, how often is this used? Well, it was mostly used for our shuttles to pile on the mainland, but those trains were taken from us at the outbreak of the war. They've never returned. Mm, might be worth looking at the need for such a platform here. I don't think that there are any plans to replace the service, after all. We have the Alfredston to Cardiff local services, anyway. The platform itself will be too costly to remove, but I'm sure we can relieve you of the infrastructure. I mean, that is fair enough. Anything to save unnecessary costs. Now you're thinking logically. BR were right to keep you on. Anyway, shall we continue on down the line? I want to read those takings for the station on the way to Retford. Absolutely, let's go. We walked back to Rook, who was waiting further down the platform. I allowed the auditor and his assistant to board the train whilst I had a quick chat. We got a good start, sir. Certainly looks like it, Rook. I'm speaking their corporate language, so I think we might actually get through this. Glad to hear it, sir. You know our schedule, so I won't bore you with the details, but if you could keep the speed down between here and Retford, it would be appreciated. I've got a lot of paperwork to get through with them, and I'd like to have it done before we get there. I'll try my best, sir. Leave it to me. Excellent. Right, I'll get on board and we can get out of here. I leapt on board as Rook pulled away. We trundled along the main line, paperwork being checked with a fine tooth comb by the auditors. I'm glad to say the first set of financial records were all in order, and we arrived into Repford with time to spare. The inspection continued here, the auditor wanting to see the engine sheds, station and dockside goods yard. Whilst we were down at the docks, Rook was chatting to Rod, who had just arrived from Stomouth. So, going well so far? It would seem so, although it's too early to tell really. There's plenty of opportunity to get caught out. Might happen sooner than you think. Shaw was getting in a flat this morning because he thought he'd marshalled his train wrong at the docks. Well, what difference does that make? It all comes here and gets separated anyway. I think he's attempting to take the local goods wagons too. Said it would save time. Oh, for goodness sake. If I had hands, and indeed a face, I would face palm so hard right now. Look, don't shoot the messenger. I know, it's frustrating. I mean, there's a reason why we run fast and slow freight. The path in is all wrong. I mean, you'll overtake us at Forley, I bet. I don't even know how they'll put us in between the timetable unless they start being rather sneaky. Well, we'll just have to deal with what we've got. Oh, hello. Here comes a state visit. The auditors and I were indeed heading back towards the station. Something at the shed caught the auditor's eye, and he rushed over to inspect. Look at this, a saint! How quaint! I haven't seen one of these for a long time, and in such good condition. I remember catching the train to work behind one of these every day as a young man. Lord Stavell, her cleanliness and condition is a credit to you. What a treat! Satisfied with his finds, the auditor was in a much more cooperative mood and happily instructed us to stop at all the stations on the way to Stomouth. Things were quickly wrapped up at Forley, as not much needed to be looked at. However, we had to wait for Rod to pass us with his local service. Tell me, Lord Stavell, that manor of yours is one of the most recent batch, is he not? Yes, I'm surprised that batch was made in all honesty, but I'm glad they were. At one time, all ten were allocated to this island. I think we're a good place for running in. So 7834 is the only one you have left here? He's the only one who wanted to stay. He likes the peace and tranquility of the island. I know that feeling all too well. 
What I'd give to live out here in the countryside. Alas, my humble city abode will have to suffice. Once the section was clear, we proceeded to Castle Savelle, where Rook shunted into the goods yard. I alighted the train and dragged the auditors around the entire complex, wanting to impress. This was, after all, my home station. As we performed our walk around the station, Shaw came into view with one of the longest freight trains we'd physically allow on the branch. He looked as if he was barely breaking a sweat as he pulled into the platform. I say, that's rather a long train, Lord Stavell. Oh yes, it's almost the longest we permit on the branch. Must have been a good morning down at the docks. A ship docked from Newfoundland this morning. Raw materials and parcels are plenty aboard today. Another contract, another revenue source. Glad to see we're still gaining those at least. Our conversation was cut short by Bride. A shrill whistle announced her presence as she blasted through with the continuation of the express from London. But when she was clear, Shaw got the road and he too disappeared. I continued the orders of the station and shortly we were back aboard Rook's train and heading for Wantage Halt. Rook was secretly glad that Shaw hadn't attempted to take the fast and slow train at the same time. There may have been a huge conflict in the timetable, and it may have made me look rather silly. Soon, we stopped at Wantage Halt, and the auditor poked his head out of the train. Not much point getting out, my lord. I've seen the entire station from here. Just show me the finances from here on the way to Stobra. Unfortunately, the finances from the halt weren't as good as I would have hoped, but the auditor was understanding. We arrived at the halfway point of Stobra, where Rook positioned himself in the old goods yard whilst we once again took an extensive look around the station. Stobra was quite an important station on the railway. Once the southern terminus of the line until the leg to Stomath was completed, this station was now a junction whereby trains could either continue along the line towards Retford, or take the branch towards Casterbridge Junction, and ultimately Alfredston. There was a steep 1 in 37 gradient, almost immediately having left the station, which was a challenge for even the strongest of engines. Another station down, and we were once again on our way south along the branch, arriving at Sparshot on Stow, once we'd waited for a northbound train to clear the section. Sparshall had once boasted two platforms, but was now relegated to just the one, a decision made by the Great Western Railway during the war to cut costs. It did still, however, hold most of its rustic charm. Sadly, Sparshall was one of the places where the riverboat still clung to a monopoly on freight. The railway had no choice but to run along the higher route through the top of the town, meaning heavy freight was unable to navigate the small and steep roads from the riverside to the railway. We did, however, hold the monopoly on passengers, we finally arrived at Stomath. Right then, Rook. I believe that we will be here for a long time. There's plenty for the auditors to look at, and I would like to take them up to the manor for lunch. You may as well stable your coach and yourself out of the way, and when we need you, we'll call for you. Sounds good to me, sir. I'm going to fill up on water and coal and have a rest. Rook did just that and soon found himself dozing in the sun whilst Bride was simmering happily, almost ready to collect her coaches and take them back through to Cardiff on the new Wessex Express. He wasn't in the mood for conversation, but Bride insisted on knowing what had occurred over the course of the morning. So that's about it really, all I've done is move from one station to the other, waiting for a minimum of 30 minutes before heading to the next station. It's like having a local freight train, except I don't have to shunt wagons around each yard and there's no time constraints. It's brilliant really. Certainly sounds like it's going well, which is a breath of fresh air for sure. I'm hoping Lord Stavell is finally beginning to feel a weight lifted from his shoulders. Well, you never know. It's hard to tell with these auditor types. One minute he's miserable as sin and the next he's oogling at you. Well, I for one quite enjoyed the attention. He's a man of taste at least, even if his choice of profession is profoundly dull. Time went by at what felt like a snail's pace. Oliver came and went back out with his local passenger service, but the early afternoon was tranquil, 
The sound of waves lapping at the shore and the seagulls crying into the sky accompanied the soft simmering from Rook and Bride. Soon it was time for Bride to depart for Cardiff, and she gave Rook a cheery whistle as she blasted away northwards. Her crescendo of noise faded to a whisper and then died completely as she got further and further away. It was mid-afternoon before I made an appearance again. The auditor, his assistant and I felt a lot fuller than intended, having been rather carried away with helpings of lunch. We climbed aboard the train once more, intending to make our way to Alfriston non-stop, but those hopes were dashed almost as soon as we left. The signal protecting the docks branch was at danger, and the signaller walked down to Rook with some bad news. Shaw is stuck at the bottom of the incline. He's found an oily patch on the track and he can't gain traction to get the train underway. Can you help, please? Well, there's no time to uncouple this coach. I bring it with me. Rook pulled forward past the junction, and then when he was given permission, he reversed down onto the stricken train. Remember when you said you were sure you could handle the freight trains on your own today? Shut up. It's not my fault the lines are so slippery. This would have been a doddle without it being there. Excuses. Come on, mate. Let's get you going. I'm only taking you as far as the viaduct. You're on your own after that. Mm, better than nothing, I suppose. The two engines put down all their might. Sure, slipping and sliding at first. But finally, having been dragged over the affected patch, he was able to dig in, gain traction, and almost push Rook up the incline ahead of him. They stopped on the viaduct so Mr. Pocock could set the points and allow Rook to shunt into the head shunt. Then reset them so Shaw could thunder away. Once he was gone, Rook reversed back onto the branch and waited for the signal to clear. The auditor had seen Mr. Pocock and was interested in his job. He clambered out of the train and confronted the man. I say, hello. Good day, sir. Oh, you're Australian. What of it, mister? Oh, uh, nothing as such. Uh, I just wanted to ask you what exactly your job is. Uh, well, I work the points here at the ground frame for the head shunt, and I perform other tasks like track inspections from Stomath to Sparsholt. Permanent way type things, you know. I see, and you've been doing this for how long now? Well, let's see. I came over in 1915 to fight in the war in the late Lords de Vell's regiment, took a fancy to the island when we came back for short leave, and joined the railway when the war ended. A hardened veteran of the war and the railway, I see. Have you ever considered retirement? Oh, not me, no, sir. Besides, I don't know if his lordship would allow me to continue living in my house if I retired, what with it being needed for the next person to do the job at all. I can assure you, Mr. Pocock, you won't be moved from that house. Are you saying this is a railway property? Well, it's property of the Stovall Railways and Estate. The technicalities of ownership now would be rather tiresome and probably only to be understood by some pencil pushers in London. Uh, now that's rather interesting. Thank you, Mr. Pocock, for your time. No worries, I'll let the bobby know you're ready to go. The signal dropped with a satisfying clunk, and Rook pulled away. The journey was pleasant enough except the continual scratch of the auditor's pen as he wrote his notes. I didn't look and only spoke when he asked questions. We were soon passing through Stowborough, and I went to the window to listen to the loud bark of Rook as we began the climb up the branch towards Casterbridge Junction. We stopped at Stow Tor, a small wayside station and the only intermediate station on that branch. I read that this is a station that deals mostly in holiday traffic, a weird destination. This is a popular place for ramblers, you see. They walk the moors around here and the titular Stowe Tour up above us. We even have camping coaches for those who want to extend their break. It's rather profitable. 
I'm glad to hear it. I won't bore myself with the paperwork for this place then. Let's go. We continued through the forests, finally emerging at the junction, where Ben arrived with his auto train. Hi Rook, things going well? Oh yeah, seems rather good now. Although, they've done a lot of poking around and had a right go at Mr. Pocock. Lord Savelle had to step in to cover his tracks. I don't want to stir, but I don't think we're going to do as well in some areas. Is this order to one of those old dragons? I can't work him out. At some points he could be rather agreeable, and almost seems like he's enjoying himself, especially when he saw Bride at Retford earlier. But then, like earlier with Mr. Pocock, he can suddenly become this rather nosy and overbearing character. Can't make it out. It's hard to describe. Well, I suppose that sort of attitude comes with his profession. He is an inspector, after all. Yeah, I guess you're right. Afternoon, lads. Nice done. done. Anyway, I better go. I can't hang around here all day. Wouldn't look good on the audit now, would it? All right, mate. See you later. If the old codger hasn't closed us down by then. Huh, always the optimist. You'll turn out like pilot if you're not careful. That'll be the day. Ben departed with his auto coaches, and Rook continued to doze in the afternoon sun. His nap was rudely interrupted by our return, and he begrudgingly made his way down the main line to Alfredston. He positioned his coach in the bay platform and allowed the inspection to continue whilst he headed to the sheds to replenish his water and coal. As he spun on the turntable inside the shed, Morgan and Stan piped up from their shed rows. Well, if it isn't the pride of Stomouth. Who's that then? I was just about to ask the same thing, you know. It's a bit rude. Enjoying being a railway taxi, are you? I've not managed to duck out of doing this much work since I blew a cylinder end cover. It's been bliss. Typical Western tank engines. Lazy. Don't you start. I read stories of your jinties, not that I trust them. That Colin fellow seemed rather explosive at times. He wasn't that angry, I just embellished the story somewhat. Anyway, how is it going, do you think, hmm? Well, I don't really want to say much. Not, not really. I guess we'll find out later. Are you enjoying covering for 4,000 whilst he's away? Could be worse, I suppose. I've run to Cardiff and back twice today already. And I'm taking the 1800 Express in a little while, so can't complain. Although it would be good if you could hurry up with the calling tower. I need to get ready. Oh, don't rush me. I'm relaxing today. No more than any other day. I resent that. Doesn't stop it being true. Haven't you got a train to pull? Yeah, the 1745 to Manchester. Well, hadn't you better get a move on? If it hadn't escaped your notice, you're in the way. Nah, excuses. I'll push you out of the way in a minute. Fight me. Are you seriously suggesting that you want to pick a fight with a Black Five, of all things? Well, I wouldn't want to pick one with Hercules, now would I? That's very true. I mean, if you could actually find him, that would be a miracle. He's nocturnal, so I don't know what I'd have to do. I don't care. Now, please get out of the way. I can feel Stan having an aneurysm. Oh, I knew there was a reason why I stayed up north most of the time. Rook moved off the turntable, heading to fill up then moved out of the way to allow Stan and Morgan to make their way after the sheds. Stan headed straight for the platform, whilst Morgan fussed around, taking his turn to fill on coal and water. Soon Stan was blasting off into the evening, and whilst his steady exhaust beat faded into the distance, the sound of three men talking wafted over to the sheds and steadily grew louder. Well, I'm glad Alfredston is still the heart of the island as it always was. Profits seem to be soaring here, and it is well looked after by the area manager you appointed. Yes, my son is doing very well at his post, and I hope he'll take over the entire network one day. Yes, I'm sure he will. Anyway, I'd like to tell you my preliminary findings before I go away and write my report in full. Right, yes, of course. We'll head back to the coach. This way, gentlemen. The meeting went on for a little while before the auditor and his assistant left the coach and boarded Morgan's Express, which duly departed for the mainland. Good day, sir. Rook collected the coach, and we headed back home to the Stovall Valley. 
Later that evening, I gathered the engines once again at Retford Sheds to give them the preliminary results of our audit. Come on, sir, spit it out. How do we do? Oh, I bet we're going to be closed. I can feel it. I can't go back to the coal fields. You weren't there, man. Get a grip of yourself, you oversized prairie. You don't know what I saw. Where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Could you please pipe down? I, for one, am rather more interested in what Lord Stavell has to say. Yeah, come on, Stovey, give us the news. Rod, if you ever call me Stovey again, I'll scrap you on the spot. Oh, so it's alright for Rook to call you that, but silence! I'm happy to say that we're not being closed, and I'm still in charge of you lot, for all the good it is. So what's the good news? I hear the London Transport Company is looking for panniers to join their fleet. Point made, shutting up. Anyway, as I was saying, I'm still in charge of you lot. The railway isn't closing. In fact, we're making strong profits in both passenger and freight sectors, although we aren't without fault. <gasps> the flashbacks, they're coming. Will someone shut him up? Thank you. Now, Wantage Holt has been found to be a chink in the armour and is the only station on the island to be losing patronage, which in turn is obviously screwing our profit margins. The station is now under ongoing scrutiny by British Railways and it has been left to me to find a solution to its problems. Next, Mr Pocock, a dear family friend and faithful railway employee. He has worked on the railway almost as long as I have but BR feels that his job is almost irrelevant and unneeded as we progress into the modern era. They see it as an unjustifiable expense on the railway revenue. He'll be on the brink until such time I can persuade BR to keep him. I thought that auditor was being shifty around him. Yes, I know, Rook. The dirty, scheming little rat. Rook, please. As Mr Pocock is such a valued member of the team, I've made some decisions between him and I that will see his affairs remain in order for the time being. That's bonny decent of you, sir. Lastly, and most importantly, BR have picked up on the cost of our contract with the Dexby Railway to import ballast to the island. They are refusing to budge on this particular issue and have requested that I use Western Region ballast supplied from Meldon Quarry in Devon. We'll have to abide by this ruling for a little while, but I don't doubt that Mr Dexby and I will be able to sort out something. Especially as I placed a sizeable order last night. I'd be sad to see our last ties with the history of this railway cut off due to some bureaucratic pencil pusher in London. I should hate to not be able to see the hunters again. I miss them terribly, sir. So do I, Bride, but as they say, times change. We'll be alright, I'll ensure it. So apart from those small problems, we're all off the hook? Surely you mean off the... Don't you dare. Off the rook? I hate you so much. Revenge is a dish best served cold and right in your smoke box. So, adding to what I said last night, I just want to thank you all once again for being so cooperative over the course of the day. Now I'd like you to all head back to your respective sheds. Life continues as normal tomorrow. The engines split up, going their separate ways, and finally feeling a sense of freedom, having been so bogged down with dread and anticipation of today's audit. Now we are out of the other side, we are able to focus on the future. After all, tomorrow was just another day. <laughs>